Board Award uh, with great help from Professor Meng. I've uh, had the chance to spend some time in the Chinese archives um, as well. So this pa the paper that I'm going to be presenting to you is um, based on my first year of research at Oxford and also in China. Um, what I'm going to do is give you a little overview and then read you several sections that I think are, um, might be helpful. So um, my basic research question is why did Sino-Indian relations collapse in the late 50s and 1960s? I think this is hugely oversimplified in terms of uh, the idea that it was a border dispute. Um, you know, what I've learned so far in, in all of my readings is um, this goes way beyond the idea of a, of a contested border. And um, given that you had such sort of, uh, you know, serious cooperation between China and India, uh, in the 50s, for example, I mean, there, a, a border dispute does little to explain why you would have such a collapse of, of relations. And I think it has, it's something that's much more similar to the Sino-Soviet split than to a dispute over territory. Um, you know, moreover, I think that China, or sorry, India has a much larger role in um, the thinking and sort of strategic consciousness of the early, early People's Republic of China than is usually appreciated. Um, it's basically second only to the USA and USSR um, in, in sort of Chinese strategic thinking is what I, what I believe at this stage. Um, let me see. So, so the point of this is to really look at the border war in a deeper context, uh, to place it into an international context, and to look at it um, also in terms of ideas uh, that the People's Republic had of itself in the, in the early period. So there are three contexts that, that seemed important to me um, after spending a month in the Foreign Ministry archives. Um, and I've, I've sort of given them little titles here, and I'll, I'll read you what I've, what I've written about some of these. The first is national sovereignty and ter Oh, I'm sorry, one thing that's very important. I'm writing from the Chinese side. I'm, I'm not actually examining <coughs> Indian documents at present. Uh, this project was conceived based in part because of uh, declassification of thousands of Chinese diplomatic documents, um, which had only happened several years ago. Uh, they've actually all been pulled down recently, so, so that's another uh, sort of complicated part, but I did get to take a look and um, come up with some ideas here. So, so this will all be sort of from a Chinese, uh, you know, looking at the Chinese point of view. The first is national sovereignty and territorial integrity, India's threat to the new China, uh, second is Sino-Indian rivalry in Afro-Asia, the Bandung spirit as a diplomatic weapon. The third is China, India, and the superpowers, perceptions of India's superpower relations. Um, so let me just go into some of what I wanted to read to you. Uh, okay. Um, Full-scale clashes broke out between India and China in October of 1962. The sense of what was at stake on each side clearly transcended a border conflict. The militarization of the disputed border through Nehru's foreign forward policy is the most likely cause of the outbreak of the Sino-Indian border war. However, examination of diplomatic documents from the period reveals that the border war was, a culmination, was also the culmination of other sources of tension in the Sino-Indian relationship. Um, as mentioned, there were three significant dimensions to the decline of Sino-Indian relations. First, Chinese officials believed that India posed a threat to Chinese sovereignty and national integrity. Moreover, the CCP perceived Nehru's India and its apparent position on the Himalayas as a threat to the very idea of the new China, the CCP's project to reinvent China as a powerful nation that would no longer suffer the humiliations of China's past. <clears throat> Second, both India and China sought positions of regional and worldwide influence, particularly in the Afro-Asian sphere. The divergence of Chinese and, in and Indian ideological agendas was an important piece of the in the decline of the relationship. And as relations worsened on all fronts, this rivalry grew more severe. With Sino-Indian conflict at a full boil in 1962, and the outbreak of the border war that October, the, princ the five principles of peaceful coexistence, known also as Pant Shiel, and the championship of the anti-imperialism of Afro-Asian peoples that once brought the two together uh, became diplomatic weapons that each nation, that each, uh, nation used against each other. Third, as John W. Garver notes in protect, uh, Protracted Contrast, I'm sorry, protect, Protracted Contest, yes, indeed, it's my first conference paper, I apologize, um, Sino-Indian rivalry in the 20th century, the Soviet-American conflict dominated Indian and Chinese foreign policy thinking. Thinking vis-a-vis -vis the superpowers was more important to both India and China than thinking about one another. True as this may be, the Sino-Indian conflict intensified the importance of the superpowers for both, Indi for both China and India. 
as the two countries headed into conflict of their own, and even more so as war broke out, the dangers and rewards inherent in the Cold War system of superpower-driven alliances took on new meaning for Chinese and Indian security. A key concern in Chinese foreign policy thinking at the time was, quote, encirclement by the superpowers and the princes. In the years leading up to the border war, the Sino-Indian split was underway, and India viewed the United States as a patron of Indian, quote, aggression towards the PRC. As ties with its own superpower ally unraveled, and American courtship of India grew stronger, the PRC saw the threat of the United, of the United States, quote, control of India as a grave overall danger. So I'm going to start with a, with a diplomatic document from May of 1954, which basically provides an overview of um, Chinese diplomatic thinking towards India at that stage. This is very late in um, sort of the unraveling of relations. My period looks at um, 1959 to 62, and when the sort of tensions are really at a boiling point, um, sort of following the, the first clashes in Longju and that sort of thing. Um, and this, this document was, was basically um, a Chinese response to, um, to, to an Indian uh, diplomatic document in which um, they, they were sort of arguing over um, renewal of, a, of the agreement on trade and intercourse between the Tibet, the Tibet region of China and India, which was also the same document that outlined the five principles of peaceful coexistence known as Panchi. So the Indian side had refused to, um, to renew this document based on worsening relations, um, and then so the Chinese side issued a response to, to where they were in the conversation. And it starts, well, there's, there's one part of it that's sort of a, an interesting quote. Um, this is all coming from the Chinese document. People cannot but recognize that a dark side to Sino-Indian relations existed from the beginning. So now this document has a lot to do with Tibet. Um, the beginning is, is 1950, um, and the, the Chinese uh, document says basically... Um, that India had called Chinese, uh, China's exercise of sovereignty, um, this is quoted from the document, um, in 1950, on its own territory, Tibet, an invasion that was lamentable and without justification. <laughs> and India had also stated that China had greatly added to trends of tension in the world and trends oriented, oriented towards a great war, disturbing the friendly relations of India and China and also the interests of world peace. Um, afterwards, the Indian government directly per permitted a group of fugitive Tibetan elements in Indian Kalimpong and other areas to carry out activities that were damaging and subversive to China. This kind of activity is clearly interference in China's internal affairs. Okay, so the 1954 agreement was meant to end Indian ambivalence about Tibet, and the problem of Indian, quote, interference in, China, in China's internal affairs is repeated often in Chinese communications with India. It was on this non-interference that stable Sino-Indian relations perhaps most cruci crucially rested, despite larger proclamations about the purpose of the relationship. Um, then also in 1959, um, with the Tibetan uprising, many see this as a turning point in China-India relations. I think this diplomatic document says, says otherwise, stating that you know, basically you have 1950 where, where there's a, a position on Tibet that, that China really does not like. Then 1954 is basically expected to settle that you know, with um, the five principles, including mutual respect for each other's territorial integrity and sovereignty, mutual non-interference, and then you're sort of returning to the, to, um, to the same issues in 1950 by 1959. So the, the document goes on um, into India's response to the 1959 uprising included uh, indulging Tibetan rebel elements in India in carrying out political activity and holding anti-PRC traveling demonstrations um, assisting Tibetans in the distribution of treasonous statements and permitting the issuance of the constitutional draft for so-called Tibetan independence. Okay. Um, now, so the 1954's principles of peaceful, peaceful coexistence were in fact a double-edged sword. On one hand, they were meant to set a new example of how um, interstate relations could and should be conducted. On the other hand, they were meant to neutralize Indian challenges in Tibetan affairs an issue which dogged the People's Republic's international relations far beyond its dealings with India, especially at the United Nations, but in which it saw India as the primary source of trouble. Thus, even uh, the supposed achievement of Pant Shil reveals contradictions in the Sino-Indian relationship. Nehru stated that if all nations were to follow these principles, indeed there would hardly be any conflict and certainly no war. The Chinese saw them as the end of Indian, quote, meddling in a region of primary strategic concern. However, as time went by, the fundamental conflict of interest remained. 
as the main 1962 notice went on to claim, it is very clear that the Indian government has not at all resigned itself to China's exercise of sovereignty in Tibet. Okay, so India's apparent violation of the 1954 agreement and continued threats to Chinese sovereignty and ter territorial integrity, quote, in Tibet, um, were, not only the, uh, were not the only difficulties presented to the, to the People's Republic by May 1962. The conceptualization of the Indian threat goes even deeper to a level achieved only by the United States and later the USSR. Sovereignty and territorial integrity were critical issues for the PRC both in principle and practice. Even more importantly, however, as the May 1962 notice points out, they were integral to the PRC's idea of the new Chinese nation. Um, quoting from the document, since the founding of the People's Republic of China, the Chinese government has put special emphasis on friendship with India. Moreover, it has tirelessly persevered in its efforts um, to safeguard and consolidate this kind of friendship. However, regardless of anything, the liberated new China cannot permit itself to be pushed back once again to the position of suffering that was the old China. So I mean, this, this to me is a very interesting and important phrase, the idea that um, the, the Sino-Indian conflict had reached this point in which um, it represented uh, the old China and China's position as a suffering country. And so you can see the sort of level of resistance um, that the PRC um, s seems to think is necessary. Um, so thus, the threat post, uh, posed by India was not only to the operating principles of the PRC and its own rule and security, but also to the concept of a new inviolable China. The Chinese perception of this, sorry, the Chinese perception of an Indian threat thus had several levels. First, it was not simply about an unresolved border. China resolved sim uh, similar border troubles with a number of other states at the time. A scholarship is attested and Chinese diplomats repeated to their Indian counterparts. Second, the quote, dark side to the Sino-Indian relationship was based at least on the conflict of interest over Tibet, which was seen as a threat both to Chinese territorial integrity and to Chinese sovereignty, um, the defense and strengthening of which was the purpose of China China's pan Shield agreement with India in 1954, the high watermark of Sino-Indian relations. Third, as phrased by the quotation above, the full implication of the, of the India question was that, um, was that of a threat to the national project of the PRC, perhaps even to the very idea that the Chinese people has, have stood up, as Mao phrased it in 1949. The confrontation with India and the prospect of kneel, yielding to India's apparent wishes implied a return to the, quote, suffering position of the, quote, old China and all that this meant for the new project of Chinese nationalism. The stand-up thus touched a significant, uh, significant nerve in the new Chinese identity, where sovereignty and the, and the dignity of the nation were bound together. This nerve had been touched other times in the early history of the PRC. From the Kuomintang's 1949 flight to Taiwan onwards, the PRC saw the United, saw United States support for Taiwan-based Republic of China and its political separation of Taiwan from the mainland as, um, as a breach of the sovereignty and integrity of China. The Soviet Union also touched this nerve as relations with China went into decline in the late 1950s. In 1958, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev's um, proposal of a, so of a nuclear submarine base on the Chinese coast met with outrage from Mao Zedong as a violation of China's sovereignty um, and is considered a revealing, uh, uh, a revealing episode in the Sino-Soviet split. The Soviet leader had unwittingly believed that this would be a welcome idea in their shared strategic struggle against the United States. India has never truly been understood as a contender for such sensitivity and such ability to alarm in the history of the PRC. What is often thought of as a mere boundary dispute was apparently seen by Chinese diplomats in the same light as primary transgressions in the Sino-Soviet split and the continuous Sino-American hostility of the early Cold War. As such, the troubles of the Sino-Indian relationship at its deeper levels are perhaps more akin to the comprehensive problems of the Sino-Soviet split um, than to those of a territorial or border issue violent, uh, violently handled. Though the Sino-Soviet alliance, beginning under Stalin and Mao, offered greater benefits to the PRC than the offerings of Pant Shield, the fallout is similar in that each one ultimately tested Chinese nationalism and forced the PRC, or so it believed, into a defensive position in which its own sovereignty and sense of independence out, um, outweighed the benefits of the relationship. In an interesting moment related by the scholar Xu Yan, Nikita Khrushchev uh, discussed the Sino-Indian border question with Mao, Zhou, and Chen Yi in 1959 following the, the first border clashes at Longju. Uh, 
The Soviet leader offered his advice to give India the disputed yes, barren territories. The Soviet Union had often given up disputed lands, mm -hmm. and the benefits of the stronger relationship with India would far outweigh those of the barren piece of territory. But the Chinese leaders would not have it. Sovereignty and national integrity over alliance, even when alliance brought power, was the message of the meeting. India's ability to, concept, uh, to challenge concepts essential to the PRC during the early Cold War and its true role in the Chinese worldview at the time have simply not yet be, been investigated. Okay, so um, the second part. Doing time. I can check my time. Um, oh wow, that's that went fast. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the Afro-Asian movement. Uh, Bandung spirit as diplomatic weapon. Uh, the cultivation of the Afro-Asian movement was one of the most important achievements of Sino-Indian cooperation in the 1950s. However, India and China had core divergences within the movement, even before their relations began to deteriorate and did not truly share a vision for the future of Asia. Where neighbors sought to build world-class in, uh, Indian leadership as an advocate of a peaceful, non-aligned Asia, in the PRC, as scholar Chen Zhen summarizes, Mao and his comrades were eager to reclaim China's central position in the world by promoting Eastern or even global revolution, a la the Chinese communist model. The Afro-Asian sphere, uh, based initially on ideas of anti-imperialism, had become an ideological battleground by the late 1950s. Where neighbors India was against global polarization, Mao's China was in favor, believing that it was in the interest of global communist revolution. Moreover, working in the service of utterly different ideas, the PRC aimed to put Afro-Asian countries on, quote, a more militant path and encouraged them to draw Marxist political class lines within their society. As Garver notes in the, P uh, in the PRC's view, failure to draw such class, class lines um, and wage intense struggle against the local lackeys would leave nations enslaved to imperialism. By 1962, with Sino-Indian conflict openly building, the Afro-Asian sphere had become a court of opinion in which each country uh, sought to mobilize against each other. PRC rhetoric at the time shows the ways in which China no, um, sought not only to isolate India in the context of the border war, but to undermine its position within the sphere of developing countries that it had helped to mobilize, if not create. Um, let me see. Uh, let me read you a couple of Chen Zhen quotes, since I'm running out of time. Or sorry, Chen, uh, Chen Yi quotes. Um, this is the... the your first year anniversary of the signing of um, the Sino-Nepali uh, boundary. So this is Chen Yi speaking to the Nepali delegation. The Sino-Nepali border question is a complicated one that is left over from history. A certain few people have tried to use border disputes to, to attain their own hidden aims. They once hoped and even asserted that China and Nepal were in incapable of solving this issue. However, we have solved it. We have done a good deed, not only for our two countries' people and our 10,000 generations of prosperity, um, but also for the advancement of the unity and cooperation of Asian countries, and the protection of peace in, a um, in Asia and the world. Um, let me see, the Sino-Indian border issue was originally created by British imperialism, using the Indian people's powerless situation and taking India as a base in order to invade China's Tibet and Xinjiang. Indian reactionaries are trying to forcefully use British imperialism's unrealized plan to occupy Chinese territory. Every country that takes Asian unity seriously must oppose what the Indian reactionaries are doing. This kind of method um, by Indian reactionaries can only gain the cheers of imperialism. Um, we have always upheld that whether countries are large or small, they should be equal, without exception, and respect each other. China, China firmly opposes great power chau uh, chauvinism and meddling in other countries' internal affairs. Now we are in the 1960s. It is the area in which um, national and ethnic independence movements are vigorously developing. All big countries' chauvinism and meddling subverts these activities, violates the tide of the era, and is certain to fail. So you can see that Chen Yi is um, uh, seeking to affirm China as a guarantor, as a guarantor of the um, interests of Asian countries, both in deed, through the treaty uh, with Nepal, and in spirit, through the dedication to the five principles and to the national liberation movements in Asia. Um, moreover, he's seeking to drive a wedge between India and the Asian solidarity movement, which India um, helped to create placing the Indian government through their actions on the Sino, in the Sino-Indian border conflict uh, in the camp of the very imperialist who Asian and by extension global anti-imperialist solidarity movements sought to resist. Um, I have a final section on, on uh, India, China's perception of, of India's relations with um, the superpowers. I'm not sure if I <coughs> might be running out of time here. But,
Let me think. Two, two minutes. Uh, let's, let's see what we can do. Two minutes. Um, let me see. China's war with India came at a time of, in of tensions in its alliance with the Soviet Union, and also during perhaps the most dangerous period in the span of the Cold War. The Berlin crisis in summer 1961 and the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962 uh, brought the United States and the USSR close, uh, to the edge of nuclear war twice in a short period. India's close relationship with the USSR caused consternation in Beijing during the years of tension. Moscow's declared neutrality to the 1959 Long Jew clashes was considered a grave betrayal of their alliance. By 1962, a Soviet MiG deal was underway, which would supply India with advanced Soviet aircraft even as tensions with the PRC mounted. Um, on the other side of the superpower equation, in addition to being the PRC's avowed ideological en enemy, the United States was considered a constant military threat, um, particularly through its support of the Guomindang during ongoing tensions in the Taiwanese Strait. The fear of, ho of hostile encirclement was a constant one in Beijing. While India's relationships with the USSR and the United States were far from perfect, it's very likely that China saw a uh, serious strategic threat uh, emerging as its southern brother was constantly courted by the superpowers. Um, let me see. When the border war broke out, uh, the USSR uh, changed its neutral stance uh, in Sino-Indian relations and voiced its support for China. Um, so this was met in sim with cynicism in Beijing, linking it to Soviet co cowardice in the Caribbean, uh, worry over the United States became an, an explicit concern. I guess we're, we might have to skip the US part. It's very interesting, but we'll, maybe we'll get into any questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm going to present on, uh, uh, it's, it's my archival research, I uh, happened to you know, get hold of a, an important Home Ministry file related to 1962 war. Uh, not related to 1962, but 1962 uh, period. So it's time now for us to actually dispassionately look at what exactly happened in 1962. Because a lot of writings which are now coming clearly indicate the fact that it was a frivolous war. The Chinese are not acknowledging, uh, you know, the Chinese say that the war was not there because they consider it to be a frivolous war. Now it's time for us to really dig deep into our internal matters, what exactly the politics was being played within India during the particular war. So the outbreak of 62 war, uh, you know, actually aroused a sense of patriotism and helped forge a kind of a unity. A few saw this heightened unity as an opportunity to achieve specific political and economic goals. And the four of those goals were, which according to the media, uh, you know, reports now available suggest, one was to bolster the nation's gold reserves during the, particular, during the war. The second was to make adjustments in India's policy of non-alignment. The tilt had to be shifted a bit. In short, the political demise of India's Defence Minister Krishna Menon, and these documents are now available. And lastly, to demonize the Communist Party of India, that is CPI, and project it as an unpatriotic force. So what actually, actually had appeared to be politically and economically impossible during peacetime, became actually politically inevitable in the wake of war. So my, but my paper, since all these four subjects are very vast and they need to be dealt with separately, uh, my paper basically focuses on presenting one single evidence on how propaganda, and this also ex helps explain, uh, you know, un understand the media better, against uh, the Communist Party was conducted during the 1962 war. The paper is based on archival study of the report by Ministry of Home Affairs, as I've already told you, on an Urdu book which was called Shikaste Zindan. 
it actually in English translation it meant prison uh, prison wall falls and also on the personal interview with the family of the editor of the book in 1962 the Indian government banned this book on the plea that it was anti-national the paper attempts to understand therefore the politics behind the government action the book and the politics of proscription that were directly linked to the international and domestic politics of 1950s provides us some interesting historical evidence on the nature of India-China war and the propaganda associated with it. Now before moving on to the details about the banning of the book as such, I will briefly touch upon the internal struggle that was waged on the issue of government ban on hoarding of gold by individuals as well as institutions and a foreign policy tilt towards America and the killing of Krishna Menon's political career. I will just briefly touch upon these issues. On the economic front, according to the editorial of Indian Express, written on 6, June, uh, 6 November 1962 while the war was still on, it said, and this is about gold, what we could not do in peace time to finance our economic growth by democratic means, we were now obliged to finance a defensive war. The mobilization of gold resources is, is invested with a note of urgency because of the Chinese attack during a foreign exchange crisis. This is why gold donations are as important as blood gifts." Unquote. Praising the government's policy to gather more gold through gold bonds, the newspaper also heightened the fact that the long-term sustainability of the military and economic support rendered by the U.S and that's the time when the U.S. arms were really flowing in, dependent on India's ability to convince them that we are determined to help ourselves. If you see the period, this is also the period where, uh, you know, gold uh, prices in the U.S. were plummeting uh, you know, sharply. So, you know, these linkages need to be established further. The war emboldened the lobby within India that saw Krishna Menon and Nehru's reluctance to openly embrace America as a problem that had led to Chinese belligerence. While the war was on, uh, Field Marshal K. M. Karyapa, you know, he became, he became an opposition to, uh, he joined the Swatantra Party later, and he was writing an organizer, uh, the RSS paper, and he said about this change of uh, foreign policy, hitherto our policy of non-alignment has worked well, but will not be rapidly changing patterns of friendship and loyalties between countries today make it incumbent upon us as a big Asian country to do some serious rethinking about a non alignment policy. Another player, John Galbraith, the US ambassador to India in 1962, was a major actor playing the twin game of engineering Krishna Menon's fall and also to recalibrate Nehru's prior non-alignment towards at least a quasi alignment more congenial to Washington and the West. A study of the Indian media during the war and the space allotted to Krishna Menon uh, during the war actually, uh, you know, suggests that uh, those being for his resignation from the cabinet were very, very vocal during that time. And one of the critics has actually pointed us, uh, pointed out that, uh, and I quote here, that the Chinese war lasted 30 days and India spent 18 days trying to drive out Menon, the scapegoat from the defense ministry. And the, the newspapers at the time are actually full of Krishna Menon, the headlines are full of that. Besides Krishna Menon, who was identified as a crypto communist by the right wing and the Congress socialists, the communist cadre were considered the most crucial impediment to India's war effort. The Indian Express editorial and this is again uh, in the period of November when the war was on, hailed the government's decision to keep out the communists from 31-member all-party National Defence Council constituted by the Prime Minister on 6 November 1962. And this is the time when the Communist Party was the principal opposition party in the country. Soliciting the support of professionals towards the war, the editorial of the paper said that keep our country consolidated by weeding out the indigenous communist vermin from such organizations and bodies into which 
Behind the facade of fellow travelers, they have infiltrated. There can be no place for these faceless traitors in any war committee or council. Despite their belated protestations of patriotism, they cannot be trusted and must be put effectively beyond the pale. This is the time when you know the Communist Party was also coming out with the resolution. Uh, Dange was going to Nehru and telling him that we do support you. And despite there were some divisions. The rising political cloud of Krishna Menon and the CPI emerging as a principal opposition party in 62 general elections was a cause of worry for the right-wingers as well as the socialists you know, within the Congress party. The right-wing leaders like Murarji Desai saw this, him as a potential competitor for the post of Prime Minister after Nehru, of course. And there were books being written, Who After Nehru and other things during that period. Both Menon and Nehru were also unpalatable to the Americans because their interference and outright objection to American foreign policy goes. The CPI endorsed the Chinese action in Tibet in 1959. The party was against CIA involvement in Tibet and in, and in its March 31, 1959 statement had praised the Chinese for leading the Tibetans from medieval darkness and blamed the rebellion on Tibetan serf owners backed by Indian reactionaries and Western imperialists.